Too often, the media focuses exclusively on the violent and tumultuous crises occurring daily around the world. And with clickbait exploiting negative social events for the sake of increased ratings and revenue, there are few incentives for media outlets to focus on the good that is happening in the world every day. Even media channels dedicated to peace building, sustainable development, remain focused on the ills of corruption, war, and conflict, rather than the efforts of peace builders within those conflicts. But peace talks too. And with this show, the voice of peace will be amplified. Mr. Rogers is often quoted in saying that when crisis strikes, look for the helpers. This show intends to do just that. Every day, right here in Vermont, there are thousands of engaged citizens actively building peace. We plan to amplify their efforts and we seek to develop a platform where peace builders all over the state can connect with each other across social boundaries and, and industry sectors to collaborate for the benefit of our collective community. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Peace Talks. And today we are meeting with Will Dodge. He has served as the chair of the Essex Energy Committee for the last seven years and is the deputy managing partner of, DR, of the DRM law firm. Welcome, Will. It's a pleasure to have you. Great to be here, Daniel. Thank you so yeah. much for inviting me. And of course. Hello to everyone out there. Hello to everyone out there, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, uh, let's just jump right into it. I'm, I'm excited to have you here. I know that you've got a lot to share. So uh, tell us about yourself and, and what you're working on right now. Well, so let's see. So um, I, uh, I've i lived in Burlington or in, the, in, the, in, the, in Essex now for 13 years and have been in the Burlington area for about 23 years. Uh, I was born in Rutland, but mm -hmm. I grew up in Montreal and mm -hmm. uh, always found an affinity for this place as I was passing through to visit my then girlfriend, now uh, uh, wife of almost 30 years, <laughs> okay. uh, on the way to Williams College. Wow. And I had a cousin who went to UVM. So uh, I've always loved this, this community. I feel like it is uh, you know, just uh, far enough and close enough to both the U.S. and Canada, yeah. uh, but that it's a very special kind of in-between like place. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one of the things that brought me to this area, I think, um, as I was, I decided I wanted to go to law school a long time ago. I was actually studying at the University of Texas, um, but I was thinking about this place because of its connection to Montreal, and I've got a lot of friends and family in both, both places, Vermont. Um, and Canada. And one of the things that always intrigued me about Vermont is how does a state like this that's so devoted to the environment yeah. uh, deal with things like energy and telecommunications and new technology wow. and those kind of parts of development that are both intriguing to me and, and that I like, but I also recognize that um, there's a lot of communities that, uh, you know, where th it's not always easy to get those things permitted and, and, and make them work. So, yeah. so I started out uh, before I um, became the, got involved with any type of community involvement, mm -hmm. I was really kind of working a lot on my legal career, but that meant I, I did at, the, at DRM have the benefit of doing a lot of different projects in energy and telecommunications and mm -hmm. the environment and learning kind of the, the overall fabric of Vermont, who are some of the, the important players, um, and uh, and you know, I think that kind of brings. In my mind, I was not thinking about my community very much, other than I loved Essex. I loved in Burlington. We lived there for about eight years, um, and we moved to Essex just because it seemed like a, a wonderful community with some great mm -hmm. families and a lot of friends. Yeah. Um, but for the, my first six years there, I really didn't interact very much with the you town. Were, you were more focused on just taking care of business at work and, and get your, your law firm off. Yeah, raising kids, doing all the things that I think all of us... <laughs> having a busy <laughs> life, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so when, what was the turn? Where, where was like the, the moment that you said, you know what? Um, I need to do. I need to do more. Yeah. Well, I think it was. It, it, it's a good question, and and uh, the way that I think of it is a couple of things. Mm -hmm. For one, you know, to be honest, I was like a lot of people, kind of watching election night, 2016, mm -hmm. and saw that Trump won, and and was upset about that. Okay. But also felt, as I think maybe a lot of Vermonters do, a little bit powerless uh, in that, um, yeah. in saying like, look, this is a this is something beyond our control. It's definitely going to have an effect on 
the law and on energy. I was, I think at that point in 2016, I'd been a proud Volt owner for about 10 years. That's about right. as much yes. as I'd done for, yeah. uh, or maybe about six years. Um, but, um, but it made me realize like, look, it's not enough to just kind of sit around and, and absorb the news and yeah. do your job. Like you get to a point when you're, especially I think when your kids are a little older that you got to engage with your community. Right. And so I said, what, well, what should I do? What, where, where can I actually be of value? Right. And I went to a couple of um, local or, uh, in fact, VPIRG organized a couple of uh, events where I met a guy named David Scopin uh, at one of those events. Okay, yeah, and David's great. David's yeah. great. David yeah. is on the Energy Essex Energy Committee with us, but uh, at the time, neither of us were involved with it and didn't really know about it. But I started looking around for volunteer positions, and I saw that there was this thing called the Energy Committee, and I didn't really mm. know what the exactly what the Energy Committee did. I looked up the statute to see what it says, and I looked up some information, put in my name, and the next thing you know, I got a letter saying, you know, well, you you are on the Essex Energy Committee. <laughs> you kind and of I got said, great uh, voluntold into into <laughs> service. Uh, well, well the, well, the funny part of the story is that you know I, I got on to the committee and I was excited and I figured oh, I'll just okay. go in once a month and kind of participate, see what I can do, and spread yeah. some knowledge, so forth. But um, no one contacted me, and I said, "Well, what's what's going on? Uh, wh where where are the meetings? Where are the agendas?" Yeah. And the select board informed me, "Well, uh, there really is none. Like, you're it. Would you like to chair? Would you like to chair this board that has no other members <laughs> right. right now?" Right. Thankfully, I was very wow. fortunate that Irene Renner, who's now a uh, you know a a, um, a senator, she was on the select board at the time, and she was like the ex officio uh -huh. member, and so yeah. she gave me some guidance. But she's like, "Yeah, if you want to do anything, you got to chair it. You got to do it. You got to go in there and and build it up. Build it up from scratch." And so the first thing that I did was uh, I started to you know to put out some feelers in community, and I forget exactly how it happened, but I connected back with David Scopin. Yeah, with David, okay. And his wife, uh, Natalie Braun. The, both of them are very active in 350. Uh, VT and have just been, uh, you know, are, are super passionate activists on the environment. Wow. They wanted to, they wanted to join um, and uh, we found a couple of other people and before very, too long, maybe about two, three months, we had a full committee. Uh -huh. uh, and what was neat about that, Daniel, was that you know, we had a general idea, like we all read the charter. Uh -huh. And had, what is the charter? Do, do you, well, the charter? Offhand, of course. Yeah, you yeah. know, of course. So I think our energy committee charter is similar to a lot of other um, charters in that yeah. it's, it is, uh, as written, it's focused on the municipal government of right. saying very local. What yeah. can you do to help the municipal government with our electricity bills? Rather than the, the, the whole town as, as a as exactly okay. that but as we started to and so you know which is all fine and certainly yeah. it's part of our mission and we Absolutely. want to make it work because every time you you know find some benefit to reduce the municipality's costs or find a source of revenue for them like for instance you know with solar mm -hmm. you're both let's say helping the bottom line but yeah. you're also improving the environment yeah at the same time yeah, and so like that's I've I've learned a lot about that being on the committee, and I, I've really appreciated um, your focus and emphasis on uh, like energy efficiency and weatherization. Uh, you know, prior to coming to Essex, I was very focused on renewable energy development and thinking right. like this is where like the big work needs to happen. Me but, too. That's but, what I. But but it's it's not that way, right? Can you speak to that? Like how? Yeah. Like because when I read that mission, I was like, wow, we're really that focused on energy efficiency and weatherization. Well, Renewables is a part of it, but you know, yeah. speak to that. I, I want to kind of hear more of that. Well, so how did I th that come about. I think that I think that what happened is that uh, all of us kind of think the same way that you know yeah. that. Um, uh, at least before you start to learn about it, geez, doesn't it just make sense to generate more power? To just power? build a bunch of renewables. Exactly, yeah. and use renewables. But once you start to learn about it, and you know, I think we're we're very lucky in Vermont that we've had the 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 uh, Global Warming Solutions Act mm -hmm. and the Climate Council, and especially uh, VCAN, the Vermont Energy mm -hmm. and Climate Action Network, who yeah. provides guidance to all the energy committees. Which actually is happening this weekend, right? Yes. Yeah. So, yes. So like they put it on will be, all the time. 
It'll be in Middlebury College this weekend is the, the VCAN Summit, which is the Vermont Energy... Uh, what's VCAN? The, yeah, uh, Energy yeah. Climate Action, Action Network. Network. Yes. Climate Action Network. It's, it's a really great... I'm excited to go. Well, that is a plug in. Well, you know, there you go. But yeah, sure, no, yeah, no, no intention. But <laughs> no pun I think it's great. It is. Uh, and no pun with the plugging in yeah. of the energy there. <laughs> so I, VCAN, yeah. what VCAN explained through their work and uh -huh. through, and and I think the GWSA matches this up, is that when we're really looking at the broader problem of sure. climate change, uh -huh. okay, you got really forty, at least. 40% of it, maybe more like 45% of it, Yeah, it's all about transportation. Okay. And there's another 40s, let's say 45%, that's really all about weatherization, just thermal. about the inefficiency, thermal, exactly. But really what that amounts to is stopping the thermal energy that we're using from just going you know, through the, the awning, through the door, through the windows, or just... Yeah. Right, and and then what you've got left is is renewable energy. Yeah, if we're really going to solve the, the right, or at least start to solve the yeah. climate change. So yeah, I like I, I love that kind of uh, that that breakdown of that, and I want to kind of maybe spend a little more time with the with the energy efficiency. Something that I've been learning when I while out there is like, you know, on the one side, heating in Vermont is primarily you know done through gas or biofuels, right, uh, but you know, if, if we're talking about efficiency, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a long-term transition away from those fuel sources for heating until like maybe geothermal, you know, networks really become yeah. more of a standard within our towns and cities. That's a lot of infrastructure development. That's, you know, long-term strategy there, but short-term right here, right now, what we can do uh, to reduce the the need for those fuels is is better energy efficiency. Exactly, right? and a lot of that comes down to heat pumps. Really, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. so interesting because when I probably at the beginning of the the tens, like 2010, 2013, yeah, heat pumps were you know another terrible pun, but like a pipe dream. In other words, that no one actually thought that they were going to work. Yeah, and yeah. so for instance, uh, you know, there, there I think. Uh, a lot of energy and, and time was put into the uh, expanding gas pipelines, right? Right by Vermont Gas. But now Vermont Gas, you know, if you go onto their website, they'll say we'll help you install a heat pump. Right. And if that isn't a major transition, uh, transition, right? Yeah. And I think I'd like to think I think we can we can show that part of that, a small part, but a but a significant part in the end, comes from the advocacy of folks like VCAN. And working with the energy committees, you yeah. help disseminate that type of message in your community. Just like Fantastic. what you're doing, what we're all doing here, and yeah. you've been talking about this. Well, no, and I, I think it's come a long way since you know you started in Essex seven years ago with just you, <laughs> and you you kind of met with David and and David Scopin and Natalie Braun, and all of a sudden now we've got this kind of small family getting started, and you know how did how did you how did you help the town of Essex bring in this kind of awareness? You know, what was the big kind of turning point there yeah. in terms of like really helping to move more towards this uh, this clean, energy efficient, renewables kind of development? Well, I would. So it's a great it's a great question. I would say that one of the one of the things that maybe I was a little bit lucky with uh -huh. is that at the precise time that I'm trying to reconstitute this dormant or non-existent energy committee. Um, the legislature had passed uh, Act uh, 72 of 2016. I'm forgetting exactly the the, the right number, but mm. it was an act was that act focused. I think it's one, Act 176. Yeah. Um, that focused on development of energy plans mm -hmm. that are enhanced energy plans, as they're yeah. called. That basically what what those do is they focus on um, helping communities identify. Where are their renewable energy or their potential for renewable energy resources? How much of them need to be developed in order to ultimately meet the Paris commitment? Again, that's wow. focusing more on yeah, the renewable, Paris Accords. right? The Paris yeah. Accords, uh, as well as um, and, and sort of similar types of statistics for how many cars do we need to convert right. over to 
uh, hybrid electric, or electric, hybrid or electric, right? Yeah. And uh, and what other what other measures? And also with thermal, you know, how many homes do we need to weatherize? Right. And so that's obviously just to to say it out loud, like the enormity of that undertaking for something like Massive. Essex, right? Yeah. Uh, but even for a smaller community, it's it's hard if you don't have that expertise. So where do you go yeah. to get that expertise? Yeah, to crunch those numbers and really understand the data and how to formulate a strategic plan uh, to really dole that out over the next 10, 20, 30, right. 40 years, exactly. right? Exactly, where to even st where's the, even the starting point? And yeah. so the answer was really the regional planning commissions. Mm -hmm. So here in Chittenden County, um, uh, Melanie Needle and Regina yeah. Mahoney, a bunch of a bunch I'm of those working people. with Melanie lately. She's right. Great. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. She's wonderful. Yeah. So she she uh, spearheaded uh, an effort to first develop a regional energy plan, and to do that, they they really needed the involvement of people from every community, and and yeah. obviously the logical place to draw from is the energy committees. Yeah. So in doing that, that brought many of us together from, you know, Bolton and mm -hmm. Huntington and, and all these communities uh, to work on what we intended to see regionally. And then that that in turn helped us to then forge enough of the connections and get enough ideas that we could then work with that same staff and our own uh, community development office in Essex to develop a, uh, a an Essex energy plan. Yeah. And that plan uh, then needs to all go and get approved by the Department um, of Public Service and the Public, Public Utility, Utility Commission. Public Utility Commission, yeah, Correct. which I'm learning about. Can you maybe speak, what is the Public Utility Commission <laughs> and how does that get all the way down to the local level? I'm, I'm asking the hard questions Yeah, now. boy, I tell you. Oh, so the Public, U the, the Public Utility Commission, uh -huh. a, as it was originally intended, was to regulate all actual public utilities, which sure. is primarily focused on electric, whether it be electric distribution, uh -huh. electric transmission, so gas. Electricity through the wires or, you know. High heat. tension, low tension, yes, certain and, and certainly uh, gas. With they don't heat. regulate things like number two fuel oil, which is what, right. let's face it, a lot of Vermonters still get, you know, that's their primary through number source number two of heat. fuel. Yep. Yeah. They also regulate telecommunications, primarily the wireline, yeah. but also they do cell siting, which is what I do a lot of, right, for wireless. Yeah. Um, but but a, a, a thing that distinguishes Vermont from a lot of other states is that uh, the PUC along the way also took responsibility for regulating the, uh, the energy efficiency utility, which right. is Efficiency Vermont, yeah. And which became energy efficiency utilities plural. So right. now it includes Burlington Electric so Department. So it's really an alliance of utility energy efficiency based organizations that are that are trying to drive this. Exactly. Forward. And there's and and the PUC, the Public Utility Commission, has a combination of um, you know what, what we call quasi judicial, or yeah. basically they decide on specific cases whether it be a rate-making case or whether it's going to be to build a pipeline. Um, but then they also do some policy-making and some legislative right. things like, okay, how are we going to deal with the demand for electricity from cars, right, yeah. and charging stations and things like that. So so they do touch upon really every Everything. community in yeah, Vermont. Yeah, they really, they really tap, tap Based in Montpelier, across, you know, across the street from the Supreme Court, Looks very uh, innocuous, but boy, they can have a big impact on, on, on what actually happens. And, and where that really lands strongly is with these enhanced energy plans. And and so you were able to, you know, not just like build up this energy committee and, and give it a sense of purpose, but in, in in doing so, you you helped facilitate the development of an enhanced energy plan for the town of Essex uh, by tapping into these these resources, these community uh, you know, advocates absolutely uh, that, that uh, were able to kind of coordinate and come together. Can you like what you know? To me, that really speaks of leadership uh, in, in in a really powerful way. You know, what what uh, what what helped you kind of learn to to lead through through the ways through those methods? Yeah, it's a it, it's it's a good question. So I think um, you know part of it is that um, <laughs> it's obviously. It's quite something when somebody tells you there is no committee. You know, it's up to mm -hmm. you to figure it's it out. It's up to you, right? Yeah. You have to just kind of 
say, okay, well, what do I have to work well, with? Well, I think right? some people might have been like, Psh, if there's no committee, I'm not your guy. I, I'm not here. Yeah, right. but you chose a different path. Well, I mean, if you're going, you know, I had sort of made the deal with myself uh -huh. that if you, that if you know you're gonna if you're gonna do anything to try to counter forces that seem to be taking us backward, at least in terms of, you mm -hmm. know, the Trump administration dropping out of the Paris Accord and, and you know, no, no real traction in fighting what yeah. is one of our most important things to, 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 to be dealing on. with, right, which is climate change. Well, then it's not enough to just say, well, I'll go find some other committee, you know, yeah. especially when the framework is right there. Sometimes it's, it's time, it, it's, it falls on us to step forward and grab those reins and exactly make something happen. Exactly. And I guess, you know, I took, I took a little inspiration, frankly, from some different examples, you know, both far from me and close to me. So, you know, I was a huge Obama fan. I won't, I won't deny that. But I think the specific thing that I liked so much about his example is someone who you know, was very, for a period of their life was very devoted to their um, their career and sort of advancing yeah. and really making their way in the world, but took a turn toward uh, community Just activism be, and community organizing, yeah. right, specifically. of yeah. At the grassroots level. At the grassroots really. level of building something that's, you know, now, now his is much more profound, right, working in Chicago. Sure, <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, but it's still, as a principle, a, yeah. a, a, gu a guiding principle, uh, I think it's important to be looking at, you know, at, if you're if you're starting with little bits and pieces, well, don't just take that for granted. Try to make them work before you, you yeah. know, throw up the white flag. Well, so and I, in terms of, you know, in terms of community organizing and what you're talking about with with how Barack Obama inspired you through that path, you know, I, I think I've shared this poem on this show before, but I I do like to share it. It's it's a little it. haiku, just five seven five. You know, one drop ripples, but a thousand drops birth new life. Absolutely. Together we reign, right? You know, and so it's like, you know, it's that togetherness that allows for transformation to happen. And what I've really been, you know, I've been on the Essex Energy Committee for you know, uh, about six months now, I would say, maybe, maybe a yeah, little over that. six months. And I've been really inspired by your leadership, Will, and, and your capacity to bring that that collective participation uh, to the committee that that we're in, and and uh, you know, learning about your story and how you built it up from from scratch, like you say, you know, that is what we're talking about here. It's a it's a type of transformational leadership. Well, yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. I think the the the, the other thing that I. Um I thought about a lot is that I've been very lucky in my legal career to be, you know, trying to involved in a lot of projects that require you to build some bridges and yeah. to think creatively about how to make the best out of, you know, what sometimes is a terrible tough situation, situation or a tough situation. Yeah. Um, I was very, we didn't talk about this yesterday, but I was very fortunate in the in the early zeros, mm -hmm. to work on a uh, on a compromise for uh, stormwater uh, legislation at the time that you know it spurred out of litigation, but it started to go into the legislative arena. Yeah. And um, I saw I was trying to draw my connections from the people that I knew, but also ended up working with a lot of other like wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, and it ultimately, you know, sp sprang to life in a piece of legislation that helped regulate stormwater in a brand new way. Wow. Uh, and yeah. so that, so, that's so I think I've been, yes, that's, it is definitely peacemaking. Yeah. And, it, and so I drew a little bit from that lesson in thinking when we were all together doing the, you know, the, the regional energy plan, we sort of finished it. And then we weren't together. And I said, and I think I think other people have the same thought. Why don't we get together to try to do, you know, if we're going to be talking about weatherization every fall, right? It's right. a ritual that I think right. everybody uh, green up. The, the, well, not green. Uh, not, green no, up is green in the up spring. Is in spring. But in the fall, button it's always button up. Button up right? is in the spring. It's fall. kind of the, right. the major push, if you will, statewide to do weatherization. We organized a. Um, an event with Jericho and Westford uh, and a bunch of other energy uh, committees to have kind of a regional showcase 
uh, at um, at the Essex Experience, where the where you go to see the T Rex Theater, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. It had been converted over. That's a particularly inspiring place for us because um, Peter Edelman, who owns the uh, the what used to be called the Essex Outlet Malls, and right. is now called the Essex Experience. Yeah, he's really transformed that space too. He he has, and one small you know part of that is if, I think if you look around, you'll see it's one of the only kind of commercial shopping mall areas that has solar panels all over the roof. Right, yeah. And Peter and I talked about that and I said, boy, I think it's one of these things that if you, if you consider that, there's gonna be a lot of, not just tenants, who think like maybe that's the place I want to be? Maybe my bills will be a little right. cheaper, but it'll certainly be cleaner. But also that um, I think it's an inspiration to to everyone to see a space like that, especially one that's occupied that's that big, getting getting you know being yeah, solarized, being being, uh, being solarized and and using cleaner sources of energy. Right? Exactly. I mean, this is you know this is, you and I talked a little bit. Uh, have talked a little bit about natural capital, right? And the, you know, the use of of renewable energy is one form of natural capital. But the idea behind that is is is, you know, capital development is something that grows, yes. right? And quite often through conventional wisdom, what we think of when we think of the natural environment is, you know, exploitation until depletion, right? That's the old model. That's kind of what has been happening for a few centuries now unfortunately right. right you know and so what we're seeing with solar and with these new developments in weatherization and efficiency and and trying to trying to change the way we engage with our environment it's much more of a generative process now exactly right? it, it's about developing that space how can we in, expand our natural environment how can we expand those natural resources in a way that serves us, but can be be sustainable over the long term. That's right. You, you know? know, when we did the the energy plan for Essex, and I think this is a lot of other communities will will have experienced this too. One of the things that we kind of realized is, wow, one of the best potential resources that we all have are parking lots because they are the perfect place to solarize, right? Because mm -hmm. usually they are cleared of. You know, there's mm -hmm. no trees or anything yes. nearby. So why not? Why not? Exactly. Yeah. And so I think our energy plan, like many others, will focus on some of those areas and say, boy, this would be a perfect place to put a solar canopy. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, those solar canopies are great on multiple levels. Not yeah. only are they, you know, generating electricity. But they create shade. They create shade. And honestly, if you're walking from your car on a rainy day or a really snowy, slushy day. It's really nice. That, uh, you you cover. Yeah, you got some cover there. And yeah. you have to imagine, too, that we're going to get to the point in not too long, right, with the with the rate of adoption of electric, electric cars, vehicles. that those canopies are also could potentially be you know, combined with charging stations. Electric to, vehicle charging stations. To absolutely. make it a lot easier. And we're, we're lucky in Vermont that we have so many pioneers kind of work thinking about Flex Uncommon. Mm -hmm. I feel mm -hmm. like was a real pioneer about that. They've been great. We've reached out to them um, and have organized events with them within Essex. Um, yeah. You know, or just co-sponsored it like some of their, um, their, their sun, you know, their sun run events. And so I think that, you know, just back to the point, of about Essex experience, that is a perfect place where we had this resource yeah. that didn't feel like a resource until you started to look at it and think like, how else can we use this? Yeah. How can we t how can we use our natural environment or the environment we have in this case a blacktop, which doesn't feel natural at all? But how can we convert that into a space that is something new, uh, something new that does rely on natural resources in a way that generates more than where we were before, right? right. Yeah, that's... Uh, so we were, to use your haiku, I mean, yeah. we were one raindrop in that whole process of transforming right. that place, but it's wonderful to see that it is transforming, and it's proof that, you know, every little bit of pushing that you can do, Absolutely. you know, for your community is going to have an impact. Yeah. Uh, you know, it doesn't all, like, for instance, just to take you another example, when we did the Essex Energy Plan, we oh. looked pretty seriously at, wow, do we actually have hy hydro resources? Could we do a micro-hydro? Micro micro-hydro power kind of process. A lot of people in the community or in you know greater Burlington have been to Indian Brook, right, to mm -hmm. walk their dogs. And when you come into mm -hmm. Indian Brook, there's that nice, there's that beautiful little 
you know, tiny dam there. And we looked pretty yeah. seriously at, yeah, well, absolutely. could we make it work? Um, yeah. and, we were, and we benefited actually from the expertise of some of the folks in South Burlington who mm -hmm. had done their own micro hydro project. Right. They'd actually, at least, it looks like theirs is, is actually working. Uh, but they had a much bigger vertical drop. So they, we got lots of information from them. We ultimately ruled it out as a resource. But in doing so, we discovered a couple of other things uh, about, um, you know, about Indian Brook and about micro hydro that surely we're going to be able to use and share in the future. Yeah, no, I, and so that's, that's the, it's incredible to see that kind of creative energy. You know, I, I think we touched on this, like, if we were looking at energy, you know, 25 years ago or, or 30 years ago, in comparison to, like, the conversation we're having right now about energy, you know, I mean, 25 years ago, uh, energy was not a subject that people wanted to talk about. It, no. it, was, it was not, it was old. It, it was, uh, it was uh, you know, based on an industry that's been around for over a century now. Right. Uh, and really just, it... It wasn't doing anything to benefit the planet other than, you know, creating an economy that ran the world. <laughs> yeah, it did there, that. there are great benefits that have come out of the fossil fuel industry, but not in a way that is in alignment with nature and not in a way that I think most of us really want to participate. Yeah, right? that's sustainable. Um, you know, I was thinking um, a, 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 a inspiration from long ago to me. Yeah. In other words, like, why did I ever get interested in any of this kind of area? Yeah. You know, it's fun to go back and think about that. Well, for me, there was one of those Usborne books Usborne. when I was, I, yeah, have so you I, ever had those? I, or like, yeah. I think now it's DK, but they're very similar to DK okay. where they're explaining things about the world, the world we live in, nature. especially when you're okay. 11 or 12 years old. Sure. And I have an enduring memory from one of those books that was about, you know, what is going to happen in the future? What, what, uh -huh. what, uh, what, what are cities going to look like in the yeah. future? And it was a juxtaposed picture. And on one side, you have what the world will look like if we do nothing about the environment. Ah. And in it, it w looked very much like Blade Runner, right? Uh -huh. You had kind of darkened heaps of skies, trash. heaps of trash, um, you know, raining, and um, everything looks like it's covered with soot. People walking in in, in gas masks, in gas masks. On, along the street. Yeah, that's a that's not that's you know a dark that was image. a dark future. Yeah. And right next to it, on the on the very next page, and this is the, the, to me the more inspiring part, uh -huh. was the very same location. People are walking, you know, without any gas masks. It's sunny, but you could also see that all the vehicles were electric, that there was green space in the median between the electric train and yeah. the electric cars. There was, an there was a person on the bicycle, yeah. right, uh, going along using a dedicated bike path. Yeah. And to me, that juxtaposition of the image has always kind of summed it up like, right. boy, we could pick one direction or we could pick the other. Yeah. You know? Well, and if we, if we, if we don't pick soon enough, you know, Mother Nature may pick for us. <laughs> That's a great right. point. That's a great point. Um, yeah, I just this is uh, something that you just inspired in me, thinking back to my childhood and where my roots came from, in terms of just environmental awareness, was the Giving Tree. Oh yes, like, great. Book. Like for just like a children's book, and uh, you know that those that story really stuck with me. I think it stuck with a lot of people. It, it, it made us. It made me think a lot about like, wow, if if the tree just keeps on giving and. You know what's left at the end. Nothing left. Yeah. There's nothing. Yeah. So I, I love it. I love where all of this has come from. It's such <laughs> a rich history. Such a incredible journey to to elevate that the the uh, energy community like you have. What are you doing right now with the with the Essex Energy? Community? Well, so there's what, a, you know what's yeah what's the next steps for you. Yeah. So there's a couple of things that I'd really like to to see us accomplish. One of the things that and you know Daniel, you've been instrumental in in a lot of it. But what we'd like to do is to take that concept of a you know a regional um, event and take it one step further and try to do a button up during the Champlain Valley Fair during at wow. the at the CVE yeah. and what we what we're trying to do is get members from every uh, energy committee yeah. in the whole region to participate yeah. uh, and do a combination of you know uh, promoting weatherization promoting uh, electric vehicles uh, to really try to use that sort of incredible yeah 
energy in the sense of like the amount, human number energy. of human energy, yeah. the number of visitors, the number of people in the community that come to that event, uh, we'd really like to, to see if we can make that work. Yeah. The other thing that from my perspective is really miss, you know, aside from missing people when I started the energy or when I came to start to work on the energy committee, the other thing that was really missing was funding. Right, money. Yeah. Money. Money is a necessary component of all this. It right? is fuel, you know, it, in it a is. sense. I mean, human energy is too, and we've got that. Well, money is stored energy. Yeah, there you go. You know? Exactly. Yeah. It's there for when you need it, and then you deploy it at the right time at yeah. the right place. So we um, are trying to work with our treasurer and with uh, town staff, and also getting some help from uh, the regional planners again to set up a revolving loan fund so yeah. that. When we uh, get a project going, whether it be a new renewable energy facility um, or even things like some savings, um, you know, we have a we have a buildings manager. We did not have a buildings manager right. when we started. It was one of our real accomplishments to make sure that there's a, a full time manager. position for somebody who's literally you know, trying to weatherize all of the municipal buildings. Right, really serving that original mandate. Exactly, you know? exactly. What we'd like to do is put that money back into a fund that can then be used for other uh, energy projects. And this is yeah. not an original idea. It's really something that Montpelier, as far as I'm concerned, the Montpelier the Energy Committee, they were the leader, but others, South Burlington, many others are starting to do this. And so it's something that we want to achieve wow. because that could also really make a difference. And it's all the more interesting in that, at least now as a result of the uh, separation between Essex Town and, yeah. and the city of Essex Junction, yeah. um, the town of Essex is going to be looking for new space to build a new building. Yeah. And it would be great if we could make sure that that building is, if it's not net, net zero, zero, it should be net it should zero. Be, it should be net zero. It should be solarized. Yeah. It should be it should ideally be a have geotech. Of what the future of our community or geothermal. ought to look like, right? Exactly. You know? exactly. Like it should be that picture. Exactly. It should be the picture from uh, from the book you're talking about. What was it again? The Osborne, uh, the Os Cities of the Future. The Osborne, Cities of the Future. Yep. That should be, you know, when, when municipalities have an opportunity to build new infrastructure, that's an opportunity to capture where the where that municipality is going absolutely right? yeah. i think i i will say that i think south burlington did an excellent a truly excellent job of that yeah in that you know that market street that's emerging now when you look at those buildings in comparison to the old buildings not only are they aesthetically nicer but you can see that there's sort of an economy of scale there Absolutely. everything right together yeah. right connected by bicycle yeah. paths they were really thinking about the the human scale and they were thinking about the 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 environmental yes as well uh, yeah South Burlington has done a great job at that they have and I I can I'm confident that Essex can do the same but we yeah. but it doesn't happen if you don't if you if, put well, a little creativity and a little you have to provide you know, the right grease. nutrients you know? <laughs> that's right exactly uh, yes comp yeah well to that point this is where I always like to end the show and that is you know how are you building peace in your community right now it's a great it's a great question we I think we, I feel like we've been talking about it a lot but I really want to just bring it home now you know you mentioned being a peacemaker as a lawyer, but I think you've transitioned into a peace builder. <laughs> well, right? well, well. So, so let's just say that we've talked about that. But I, I do think it's such a great question, and you know the way that I think of it, or the, what we were talking about yesterday, is um, a, a lot of um, a lot of people have terrible uh, impressions of lawyers, and that could be for totally justified reasons, yeah. right? That their only time in their life that they get into a real legal quandary, yeah. you know, that they, that, that, that they have a, they have an awful experience. They have an awful experience with lawyers and that's, you know, un, kind of that's unfortunate. Yeah. It sets the stage. But I think that if, if, if I, and, and, you know, my terrific colleagues, uh, at, at DRM, when we do our jobs, right, we are old and that's true, whether we're actually representing a client or we're just being active in our community, which is one of you know the values of the firm, and I Absolutely. think values of, as a Vermonter, I think when we're doing our job right, we are creating peace. We are reducing or eliminating conflict, or we're, we are yeah. finding a way to ultimately achieve an equilibrium yeah. that uh, that advances things forward. And and that and nowhere is that truer when it comes to 
you know, thinking about how much we value just this thriving community that we have here in Essex and in, and in Greater Burlington, right? right? Yeah. Really think, using those skills and expertise in a way that um, harnesses future potential that, that, uh, that uh, takes, you know, because I mean, when you start talking about the PUC and the regional planning commissions and municipal enhanced energy plans and all of the stuff in between, uh, that takes a lot of expertise. Uh, and, you know, talking about like infrastructure projects and understanding zoning and regulations and right. having all of that as, as a part of this conversation, it almost takes a lawyer to to figure out how to how to carve a path in that in that direction. Well, that's right? true, but I tell you, I don't feel that our energy committee would have the success it does without people like uh, you know, like you, and who are uh, you, you are thinking outside the box. You're thinking about the piece. You're thinking about how to bring all of these forms of capital together to actually make it work. We have um, uh, you know Natalie Braun and David Scopin who are consummate activists and they're the people that will go mm. up to you on the street with the pamphlet with the form with and the explain it to you and not be afraid right. and not be not be abrasive or offensive but be yeah. bold enough to yeah. say this is something that you should be thinking about that we all need to be thinking about and we've had the benefit we had uh, Michael Fink who works at Efficiency Vermont yeah. he joined us reason, uh, you know uh, uh, a few he, years ago yeah, a few years ago and he's um, even though he's left he made a great contribution in the sense that he helped us to think about um, uh, the, oh, he managed to sort of do a rough calculation with the help of an Essex yeah, high of school the student gas. of the of Essex's GHG footprint, yeah. right? Which is wonderful. Yeah. So, bringing you know multiple um, people together, I think different talents and different perspectives is absolutely necessary if you're to get peace, right? Right. Yeah. And well, that. and so this is this is something that I would you know. As, so I, I have training as, in peace building and conflict transformation. Uh, that's kind of my space of expertise. And so it, it, when, you, when you were talking about lawyers as peacemakers, I really was like, you know, that makes so much sense uh, to me because it, if you think about the spectrum of things that happen, you know, uh, peacemaking is when, when you sign that peace treaty. Right. You know, the, the legislation you were talking about changing the water systems and, and the water rights. Right, regulation uh, of stormwater. Yeah, storm yeah, that's exactly. what I'm talking about. Yep. Regulation yep. of stormwater, that's like a peace treaty. Yes. You know, uh, and peacekeepers, they're, they're like the folks that are like, okay, you guys are fighting, so you go over there, and you go over there, and we're going to keep make everybody sure, apart. Keep everyone apart. That's a peacekeeper. <laughs> yes. But peace builders, they arrive before a conflict starts to develop. They are there when the treaty is signed, and they stay long after in order to implement on that treaty. That's right. right? And so That's like right. what, what, I, what I have seen with your story on, uh, uh, with the Essex Energy Committee is like, you showed up when nobody was there, right? Uh, and and you, you, have, you have seen that, that arc uh, as, as the Energy Committee has really stepped forward and yeah. Uh, that's that's what I mean. Like you know, so there's that peacemaker part, uh, and I think that that legal expertise is so significant because it, we do need peacemakers. We need uh -huh. folks that can strike that bargain, that can make that space and codify it and ratify it and build coalitions. Right? We need people like that, but we also need peace builders. Yes. We need folks that are in the communities that are doing the work that you've been doing for the past seven years to really advance this mission, yeah. you know? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I think, it, to me, the biggest lesson is that you should never be afraid to step out of your comfort zone and mm. go into something just because maybe, you know, maybe there's it's nothing. not what you expected. <laughs> maybe it's not what you expect. You know? um, but it's worth doing. And especially, you know, I think, um, and you've been around the country and I've been around the country and around the world, and I think, one of the things that we really need to cherish here is that people do really care about their this community and and how it works and whether it's you know has an environmental ethos that right. permeates everything. Uh, not every place is like that, mm -hmm. and so we got to take advantage of that. 
you know, doing so is we're it's, it, it's a wealth that we have to preserve. It is. It's a compl it's a complicated and a complex wealth, right? All the stuff about yeah. the PUC and Mac yeah, and all yeah. of that. But um, but it's 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 really important uh, that we do it, and I'm I'm very glad that uh, that you stepped up, mm. and and came out of your comfort zone, right? Came yeah. to a brand new place. Well, I, I and, you know my know. story it was similar. I was I was actually my expertise is really more in economic development, I, and I've had my hand in some energy projects in the past, and I care about sustainable development, environmental conservation, and there happened to be a seat available. <laughs> on the Energy Committee and not on the Economic Development Committee. And so I said, okay, this is the path there that I'm go. taking. Right? So I, I, I think that- I think you uh, took the right path. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I think so. And with that, I think uh, we all need to step into that uncomfortable space and, and really think about how we're going to move forward to create that vision of a community we can all appreciate and enjoy being a part of. Right? Absolutely. Great. Great. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again. I really appreciate everyone that's uh, stuck with us all the way to the end. This uh, show, Peace Talks, was brought to you by Community Wealth Development. Uh, and what we're trying to do here is bring peace builders together to create collective impact for our communities moving forward. Uh, next episode is going to be the finale of season one. And we'll have Will Dodge back with us, along with all of our previous guests for the last five episodes so that we can have a conversation together about how these very different folks, you know, how can we build community wealth together? You know, and so that will be the conversation that we, we step into next time. And uh, thank you so much and have a wonderful uh, June Pride uh, weekend. Weekend, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Thank you. thank you, Daniel. Thanks. Cheers. Take care. That's it. Bye-bye.